Please, we'll get started. Um, I know that we have a few more trickling in, but can you believe we are at the end of Galatians? Wow, that just like flew by, right? So um, we will have one, uh, this is tonight the last um, section of Galatians, but we will have one more uh, teaching fellowship after Thanksgiving, of course, next, nothing next week, but then we'll come back and wrap it up um, the first week. The Last week, it was the 30th, the 30th, yeah, so um, be sure to come back for that, and um, we are so grateful for Sandy and all of her teaching and study and leading us through Galatians. What a rich and full book, and I know we have can go back through and just hold on to all those teachings and work, uh, listen to the Lord as he helps us apply it to our lives, because it's not just, you don't want to be hearers of the word, right, from James, we need to be doers of the word, and that's whatever we hear in reading scripture. So let's pray and get started tonight, and um, we will hear the last part of Galatians. God, we just thank you for your rich and deep word and um, how it continually opens us up, continually guides us, continually leads us, and I pray that you would give us hearts to hear. pray that you would um, help us to listen closely and to um, be willing to say yes to whatever you have us do with these, this word. Thank you for Sandy, and thank you for the time and the effort and the study and the prayer and all that she's put around that. And I know that you will richly bless her for her investment in your word and for her willingness to share what she has learned from your spirit with us. God, just um, help her to speak your words and to be clear and uh, to be led by you tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. 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 So, I know I need explanations when things are different. Hello, hello, hello. So, today was preschool, kindergarten, Thanksgiving feast in here. And so, I came up for my grandbabes and was so precious and they sang all these wonderful thankful songs their theme they had a lot of donuts their theme was donut forget to be thankful yeah. <laughs> and they had donuts for dessert i'm gluten free so i couldn't eat any but they were here so anyway david our executive pastor was here he's such a servant he cleaned all the tables for y'all by the way before because they had tablecloths on them and he said would you mind if we left the tables like this because tomorrow xyz will be in here and the preschool is coming in to do the same program for them and i'm like well you know i really wanted tables for our last night so you can leave the tables up if you'll put them back up on the 30th so but how do you all like the tables we might just do this from now on it might be nice just to have tables from the get-go i don't know we'll see but we're so excited and with that special treat for the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. So I wanted to review just a bit of how we got here. So to begin with, we saw in Galatians 1 through 5 that it is first and foremost his grace that works to bring him the glory. And then we focused on his grace that works throughout all of history in the rest of Galatians verses 6 through 24. In Galatians chapter 2, the first 10 verses, we were instructed, instructed in his grace that works to preserve his truth. And then in the second half of the chapter, we saw his lavish grace that works through the exchange life. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 14, we concentrated on his grace that works to transform us. Then in Verses 15 through 29, we were strengthened by his grace that works through his promise. In chapter 4, we were encouraged by his grace that works to bequeath our inheritance in verses 1 through 18. And then we saw how it is his grace that works to prove our lineage in 19 through 31. In chapter 5, 
verses 1 through 15. We were blessed beyond measure by his amazing grace that works to set us free. Followed by Galatians 5, 16 through 26. And the call we have to bear the fruit of the blessing of his grace that works as we yield to the Spirit. And last week, in the first ten verses of the last chapter of this letter, God's standard for community was revealed in his grace that works Oops, sorry. as we sow to the Spirit. And thereby bear the fruit of Jesus Christ as we do life together in the body. What an amazing book. What amazing grace. Now, I also wanted to remind us of how we came to this approach in our study of the letter to the Galatians that focuses on his grace that works. This study of Galatians followed Karen's study in the book of James where she so prudently walked us through the seriousness of the call to a faith that works. And as we've learned from James and Paul, faith indeed works if it is genuine faith. But faith doesn't work by our own strength. In other words, it's not faith in our faith. Faith reckons and rests on his grace that works. And tonight, as we dive into Paul's wrap-up of his letter to the Galatians in these final verses, we will be brought face to face with his grace that works through the cross of Christ. Now, each of Paul's 13 epistles end with Paul's benediction that the grace of Jesus Christ would be upon his brethren. The grace that Paul had so powerfully experienced through the cross of Christ was the heartbeat of his ministry. Many Bible scholars believe that it was Paul's habit to dictate his letter to a scribe and then to pen his customary benediction of grace in his own hand. So we're going to see this example in three of his letters. At the end of Romans, he closes with Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsman. I did look up how to pronounce that. <laughs> I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now it started in Romans, Paul the Apostle. Gaius, host to me, and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Cordus, the brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. In Colossians, Paul said, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment? Grace be with you. And in 2 Thessalonians, he closed, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark on every letter. This is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. And now, at this point in his letter to the Galatians, Paul highlights the fact that he is now writing in his own hand. In verse 11, see with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Some scholars believe that Paul wrote this entire letter himself, and that the large letters were due to some physical problem with his eyesight. Other scholars believe that it was from this point on that Paul actually took the pen to write the remainder of this letter himself, and that it's very likely the large letters were used to emphasize Paul's great concern and love for the Galatians. But at any rate, at some point in this letter, Paul took the pen in his own hands as if to say, pay attention, Galatians. Galatians, pay attention. As I close out this letter with the distinctively clear delineation between what marks my ministry and that of the Judaizers. It is the cross of Christ. In verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. As we've said before, the cross invites persecution. Talk about God and all those ways that lead to God so that we can coexist, and no one seems to mind. But bring up the cross, and you open the floodgates for all manners of ill treatment and oppression. 
But the Judaizers wanted a happy blend. Believe in Jesus, yeah, but let's not make the Jews upset. If you get circumcised, you'll calm the rift. And Paul said, this was all for show. For their good showing in the flesh. Oswald Chambers puts it this way. We are only what we are in the dark. All the rest is reputation. What God looks at is what we are in the dark. The imaginations of our minds, the thoughts of our hearts, the habits of our bodies. These are the things that mark us in God's sight. Paul is pointing out that the Judaizers were not marked by God, and they certainly were not marked by the crucified life. They were marking themselves by their own reputation. But the other delineation, the Judaizers were not being honest, for they were seeking to avoid the cross in order to accept the glory for themselves. Paul wrote, those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves. But they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. Because anyone who is honest will have to admit the absolute and utter impossibility of keeping the law. But that didn't matter to them. They wanted to place the Galatians back in bondage and bind them with that daily 613 task to do list even though they, they themselves would not ever do so. But if the Galatians caved, well then they would have something to boast about. To boast means to glory in, to trust in, to live for. In Greek literature, characters glory in what gives them the most delight. Paul's charge was this. What gave the Judaizers the most delight was glorying in the amount of converts they could make. Hey guys, you see how many converts I have? But not Paul. His concern was not the size of the following, but the depth of their understanding and commitment to the cross of Christ. Remember, Paul had spent many a year boasting in his flesh, as he wrote in our first chapter. For you've heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my country, contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. How is Saul the Pharisee trying to destroy the church of God? By going after the message of the gospel of what was of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, as he would later write to the church of Corinth. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And do you remember where he received this? From Jesus Christ himself. And not only did Christ die for our sins, but he died for our sins on a cross. The cross in Paul's day was the absolute, uttermost example of weakness and shame. But on the road to Damascus, Saul the Pharisee, who was advancing in Judaism, met the one who went to the cross for the likes of him, for the likes of us. And Saul the Pharisee became Paul the Apostle, never ever to be the same. Warren Wiersbe commented this, Jesus Christ is mentioned at least 45 times in the Galatian letter, which means that one third of the verses contain some reference to him. The person of Jesus Christ captivated Paul, and it was Christ who made the cross glorious to him. Before Paul met Christ, he had actually identified himself with those who desired to make a good showing in the flesh, who put all their eggs in the circumcision basket. And as far as baskets go, I guess we could say that Paul's basket of flesh outfleshed them all. To the church in Philippi, he wrote, 
We're going to look at this long passage. It's so incredible. He warned them, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Paul understood in every fiber of his being and his message that it is his grace that works through the cross of Christ. No wonder his greatest delight was in the cross. For he wrote, whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And because Saul of Tarsus had firsthand experience with the person and the power of the cross, he became Paul the Apostle of the true circumcision. And there was not one question where his allegiance stood. The cross was no longer a stumbling block to him, but instead it became the very cornerstone of his message. For Paul, the cross of Christ meant he had forever been set free from the rule of self, as he wrote in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The cross of Christ had set him free from the grip of the flesh, as he wrote in 524. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And finally, the cross of Christ liberated him from the chokehold of the world, as he went on to write in 614. But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Martin Luther's comments on this verse provide us with some very much needed insight. Martin Luther wrote, the world is crucified unto me means that I condemn the world. I am crucified unto the world means that the world in turn condemns me. There's no sitting on the fence, no compromise with the world. Jesus himself told us there would be enmity between the world and the believers who had committed themselves to his grace that works through the cross of Christ. And Jesus said these words to us. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. The world can embrace the man Jesus, the good teacher Jesus, even the prophet Jesus. But the sinless son of God, who bore our sins on a cross as our only hope for salvation, that Jesus, that Jesus the world hates. After all, it's just downright foolish to think God would save us through a cross, the absolute uttermost example of weakness and shame. And Paul was abundantly clear in the world's opinion of the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he wrote, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul knew. Paul knew his grace that works through the cross of Christ was the power of God to save because it is through the cross 
that we come to understand our utter depravity and utter inability to change ourselves. John Stott wrote this. It is there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to our true size. Every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to say to us, I am here because of you. It is your, it is your sin I am bearing. Your curse I am suffering. Your debt I am paying. Your death I am dying. Nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. Tonight, may we each be cut down to size by his immeasurable grace, so sacrificially demonstrated through the cross of Christ. For in reality, it is truly only the cross of Christ through which we will bear any fruit. Listen to the words Jesus spoke as he entered Jerusalem on what we now know as Palm Sunday, fully knowing what awaited him in five short days. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. The cross of Christ represents the love of God and his purpose and plan for our lives. For it is through faith in the cross that we are born again as his new creation, not created by works, but by his grace. And Paul wrote, For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Paul's joy in the cross was so great that it excluded all other kinds of boasting. For he knew only the Almighty Creator could possibly make Saul the Pharisee into a new creation. Only his grace that works through the cross of Christ can make any of us fit to serve Jesus as he served his father. But he chose the likes of us for exactly that, that he alone would receive the glory. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, For consider your calling, sistren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. The message of the cross is foolish. Some of us are foolish to the world. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man or woman may boast before God, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We boast in the Lord as we humbly acknowledge our need and love for him with all that we are, and this has been his will for us since the beginning. Remember in Deuteronomy, that he called Israel. What does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. But the Lord did tell us there is a place for circumcision. It is to be in our hearts. He went on in Deuteronomy 10. So circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. Through humility and repentance, we invite God to cut away the hardness of our hearts, so resistant to his commands. And perhaps this is exactly what Paul had on his heart when he wrote verse 16 of chapter 6. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. This rule, not a law, but this standard. This guiding principle, 
for the Israel of God, for those declared righteous like Abraham through surrendered faith. Just a few days ago, Saturday, November 12th to be exact, I was met head on with just a, such a guiding principle as I read a brief story in Nancy Lee DeMoss's devotional, The Quiet Place. Great devotional if you've never read it. She wrote about William Borden, born in 1887, born in affluence as heir to the Borden Dairy Estate. Borden Dairy is still around. For his high school graduation, look, I mean, like we're talking about early 1900s now, his parents gifted him with a cruise around the world. But rather than being enamored with all the sights, his heart broke for the spiritual needs of all the people he encountered along his journey. As Nancy described it, his pampered heart was breaking. God was calling him to full-time Christian missions. Later, while attending Yale University, he wrote in his journal, Yes, Lord, that's what I'm willing to do. And then Nancy's devotional went on to explain. But what amounted to the crux of the issue for Borden was defined by this simple word picture that he committed to paper and etched into his mind. In every man's heart, there is a throne and a cross. If Christ is on the throne, self is on the cross. And if self, even a little bit, is on the throne, then Jesus is on the cross in that man's heart. Jesus went to the cross, but he rose to new life. And now it is we who are to go to the cross by faith that we may truly know the power of his resurrection as Paul wrote in Philippians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Christ is to be on the throne in our hearts. It's that reciprocal freedom we talked about when we spoke of Galatians chapter 5, how it is his grace that works to set us free, to choose to yield to his spirit, so that his grace has the freedom to work in us to bear his fruit. We've been set free so that we are able to choose. And as we choose to live by that rule, that guiding principle, and yield to the spirit, we give God the full right of way in our lives and the freedom becomes reciprocal. As we walk in freedom and yield to his spirit, his spirit has freedom to work in us by his grace. The freedom to have his way in us. But if he is not on the throne of our hearts, we relegate him to the place we belong. To the cross. Dead and out of the way. And as William Borden expressed, that also is reciprocal. In that his resurrected life is no longer free to have his way in us when we place ourselves on the throne to rule ourselves. But as we live the crucified life by faith, Jesus Christ is free in us to take his rightful place on the throne of our hearts and to live through us. And biblically, this is referred to as sanctification. And this is God's will for every child born into his family, that we would be set apart for his purpose, sanctified for his glory, and made fit to serve the one who sits on the throne. As Paul wrote to the first in 1 Thessalonians, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is to be the rule we are to live by, our guiding principle in life, our sanctification through faith in his grace that works through the cross of Christ. Oswald Chambers describes sanctification this way. When I pray, Lord, show me what sanctification means to me, he will show me. It means being made one with Jesus. Sanctification is not something Jesus puts into me. It is himself in me. So very powerful. It was exactly what Paul had been shown 
Paul knew exactly what his sanctification meant. Paul had been crucified with Christ so that Christ could live his life through him. The next slide is Galatians 2.20, but some of you are writing this quote because it's so good. But I'll send you any quotes you want. And again, we've looked at this scripture, but this is our application verse for all of this book. And I highly recommend we memorize it and remind ourselves. I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. But now Paul has set his peace. But more than mere spoken words... His life bore out the truth of his message, as he wrote in the second to the last verse. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. In Paul's day, it, I'm going to uh, quote from Warren Wiersbe. I don't think I put that up there, but in Paul's day, it was not unusual for the followers of some heathen god or goddess to be branded with the mark of that idol. He was proud of his god and wanted others to know it. In the same way, Paul was branded for Jesus Christ. It was not a temporary mark that could be removed, but a permanent mark that he would take to his grave. Nor did he receive his brands in any easy way. He had to suffer repeatedly to become a marked man for Christ. It was also the practice in that day to brand slaves so that everyone would know who the owner was. Paul was the slave of Jesus Christ, and he wore his mark to prove it. While the Judaizers were boasting in their circumcision as a sign of their commitment, Paul made his boast in the scars he had received because of his commitment to the cross of Christ. And for Paul, his scars were costly. He was stoned, as reported in Acts 14. They stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. He was beaten in Acts 16. In verse 22, when they had struck them with many blows, they threw him in prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet with stocks. He was met with numerous afflictions and near-death experiences as he wrote to the Corinthians. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane because he's bragging. It sounds like he's bragging, but he's telling what happened to him. It, I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonment, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. All of this as well as the burden of his concern for the believers. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. He was given a thorn in his flesh because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And he had to deal with bodily illness, as we discussed in Galatians 4. You know that it was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. But apparently... Whatever his bodily condition was, it was a trial to be around him. But when God looked at Paul, he saw who Paul was in the dark. Not only the things that others may not see, 
but also who Paul was in those dark places, in the places of hardships and suffering, in the places of persecution and affliction. And I had to stop and ask myself, and I hope you all will with me, what does God see in us when we are in the dark? And what does the world see in us? Can both God and the world see the brand marks of Jesus Christ in us? Sometimes maybe, for me, not near where I want to be. But nothing dissuaded Paul. His ministry was marked by his willingness to suffer whatever need be suffered for the cross of Christ. Paul, like William Borden, had chosen the cross for himself so that Jesus Christ would take his rightful place on the throne of his life. Christ occupied the throne of his heart, and no one could take that away. And truth be told, what more trouble could these Judaizers cause him than what he had already endured? He wasn't afraid of what they might throw his way. He would not be intimidated by the Judaizers, nor would he beg them. He had done his job well. It would now be up to those who heard the gospel message to choose for themselves, as he had said. Let, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear my, on my body the brand marks of Jesus. In reminding them of what his ministry had cost him, he was reminding them that the choice was now in their hands, as if to say, leave me now alone and choose for yourself whom you will serve. It is reminiscent of Joshua's charge to the nation Israel. The promised land awaited, but the choice was theirs to make. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, or the gods of the flesh. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We each have been given a choice. Enter his promise through faith in his grace that works or disagree with his truth and go it alone. It will not be forced upon us as the Judaizers were attempting to force the Galatians, compel them to be circumcised. Whether or not others listen to our testimony Listen to the message of the gospel. It's not us up to us. God has given us a free will to choose for ourselves whom we will serve. And I'm reminded, Jesus called himself the bread of life, but he didn't force it down our throats. We only have to live like Joshua and like Paul, as those who have chosen to trust his grace, to trust his grace that works through the cross of Christ, and prayerfully leave the mark of his grace wherever he leads. And Paul concluded with his customary prayer. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. This may have been his customary prayer, but it was certainly not a prayer by rote. Paul was undone, forever changed by the lavish, immeasurable grace of his Savior that it so worked in his life. What more could Paul do than to share with everyone and anyone who happened to cross his path? And as we close out tonight, we come back to one more incontrovertible truth, a truth that cannot be denied. Paul believed in the eternal security of the believer. He closed his letter by calling them brethren, brothers. He was writing to believers. Would there be some in the churches of Galatia who heard the letter who were not believers? Yes, of course. But again, we are reminded, though, even as these Galatians had been tempted to trust the flesh for their sanctification, tempted to escape persecution, if they had truly placed their faith in the cross of Christ, they had been born again as new creations, adopted into the family of God and secured in their position 
as eternally set apart for him by his grace that works to mark us as his own. In closing tonight, I pray we've been changed through our time, pressing in to see his grace at work. I pray we each have been marked, branded like Paul, willing to endure the cost so that others may also know the one we belong to. Let us never forget the wisdom of Oswald Chambers. It bears repeating. We are only what we are in the dark. All the rest is reputation. What God looks at is what we are in the dark. The imaginations of our minds, the thoughts of our heart, the habits of our body. These are the things that mark us in God's sight. May we reckon his gospel of grace as truth, not dependent on us to keep the law, but dependent solely on the cross of Christ, that we would be so marked in the imaginations of our minds, the thoughts of our hearts, the habits of our bodies, marked in his sight by his grace that works, even in the dark. Amen. May we be filled with ceaseless gratitude this Thanksgiving, mindful that we've been saved, eternally sealed, and marked by the cross of Christ. And so this evening, we end right where we started. For it is his grace that works, through the cross of Christ, to bring him the glory forevermore. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins on a cross, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen? Amen. 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 And I hope you will plan to join us one last time the week after Thanksgiving as we will gather around his word together in fellowship and enjoy one another. Let's pray before we go to small group. Heavenly Father, how blessed we are for your word. That each day your living word speaks to our hearts and reminds us of your truth. Lord, our desire is to be marked by you in the dark. That we would truly live not for reputation not to be known by others but to be yours in those places that no one else sees but you god we thank you for the cross for that uttermost shame and weakness that you sent your son to to confound the, the wisdom of the world and we place our faith in your wisdom god jesus christ who became to us wisdom and redemption and sanctification how thankful we are for the cross may we grow in our willingness to endure for the sake of the cross of christ it is in your precious name we pray